paying bands by helicopter, performers getting electrocuted on stage, a legendary guitarist's trippy performance, the business end of Woodstock 1969 was anything but smooth. Even before Woodstock started, chaos abounded the organizers and potential performers. According to festival organizer Michael Lang in Woodstock, The Oral History, he and his associates were set on holding a festival in upstate New York in the town of Woodstock, yet they still needed to find someone with a place there to actually host the festival, which proved to be easier said than done. Immediately, there was opposition among the large landowners in Woodstock about letting their land be used for a festival. Lang's associates even found a site they deemed suitable, but he shut them down after surveying the area and not liking the environment. According to Defining Moments, Woodstock, bands like Creedence Clearwater Revival, Canned Heat, and Jefferson Airplane had signed contracts with the festival organizers by the end of April. Despite this commitment, they had no idea where the actual music festival was going to be held. Lang and the rest of the organizers finally secured the now-famous site on Max Yasger's dairy farm less than a month before the festival was set to start. This gave the performers and their management very little time to make arrangements for flights and housing accommodations. In an interview on Kyle Meredith's podcast, Tommy James recounted that he and several other performers backed out completely when they heard the festival was going to be hosted on a farm, a decision they'd clearly come to regret. I said, well, I'll tell you what, if we're not there, start without us. And I <laughs> laughed and I hung up the phone. Oh. And of course, by Friday, we knew we messed up pretty bad. For many of the performers at Woodstock, the chaos of the event started right from the beginning. As Kevin Hillstrom explains in Defining Moments, Woodstock, the massive traffic jams that snarled the highways getting to the Woodstock site were also a huge hindrance for the performers. The festival was scheduled to kick off on Friday, but starting on Thursday, hundreds of thousands of concert goers started arriving in and around the festival grounds. Barely any of the musicians were actually able to get to the site grounds before the festival started. Locked in at hotels and motels with the highways basically shut down, the majority of the scheduled performers had virtually no way to get to Woodstock. With time running out as the festival crowd started to pile up, one can only imagine the sweat that Lang and his collaborators must have worked up worrying that the bands would not be able to arrive and perform. However, in the end, the Woodstock organizers were able to save the day. Realizing that trying to drive on the highways was impossible, the organizers arranged for helicopters to fly the musicians from their lodgings directly to the festival. Though there were still massive scheduling issues, at least the bands had a way to arrive, even if some were late. According to Defining Moments Woodstock, the massive traffic jams that prevented performers from making it to Woodstock on time made a complete mockery of the originally planned scheduling. The scheduled opening act and their equipment were delayed and didn't arrive on time, so a new act had to be put in their place, which led to a late start. To make matters worse, the weather added to the difficulties the traffic presented. Rainstorms saturated the area over the weekend, causing abbreviated and delayed performances. And the weather and technical problems pushed the show later and later. We finally got on about 3 in the morning. Some bands backed out of playing altogether due to the bad weather, causing last-second replacements to be slotted in where needed. On the second day of the festival, the lack of bands on site forced the organizers to add even more people to the lineup. And they also had some of the Sunday performers play on Saturday as well. The biggest tragedy of the bad scheduling, however, happened to Jimi Hendrix's Gypsy Sun and Rainbows. Even though the festival was supposed to conclude on Sunday night, scheduling delays pushed things so far back that Hendrix did not come on stage until 9 a.m. the following morning. As John McDermott recounted in Hendrix, setting the record straight, many of the attendees were too tired to stay for his set, and others thought the festival had ended the night prior. For this reason, of the nearly 450,000 Woodstock attendees, just over 20,000 saw Hendrix perform due to poor scheduling. One of the most memorable acts to perform at Woodstock was Richie Havens. Havens, a black folk singer, opened the Woodstock festivities with one of the best sets of the entire weekend, punctuated by his incredible performance of the song Freedom. However, Havens actually wasn't supposed to open Woodstock at all. According to Defining Moments Woodstock, Michael Lang had originally scheduled the band Sweetwater as the festival's opening act. However, when they were not able to arrive on time, Lang instead turned to Havens to get things started. As Havens recalls himself in Woodstock, the oral history, he was initially terrified of the idea of being the opening act. He was reluctant to face such a large crowd, and his bass player was still stuck in traffic on his way there. Luckily, his bassist arrived just in time, and Havens ended up playing the most famous set of his career. In order to fill up time, Havens played his entire catalog and came out for numerous encores. One of the organizers kept pushing Havens out for more encores because they had no one else to follow up. Out of ideas, he came up with the largely improvised song Freedom while on stage. 
It was a total stroke of musical genius. Haven saved the day with his early and extended performance, getting Woodstock off on solid musical footing. It's no secret that there was ample use of substances at Woodstock, considering it was at the height of the hippie era of the 1960s. Yet, most people don't realize just how much indulgence was involved on the performer side. As The Who frontman Roger Daltrey wrote in his autobiography, thanks a lot Mr. Kibblewhite, pretty much every drink in the backstage area was laced with LSD, even the ice cubes. Daltrey accidentally ingested some when he drank a cup of tea and he was still tripping when he went on stage at 5.30 that morning. Grateful Dead bass player Phil Lesh also recalled taking LSD at the festival in his autobiography, Searching for Sound. Like Daltrey, Lesh was also still under the influence when the Dead went to play, and their performance was marred by miscues and technical difficulties. Carlos Santana recalled in his autobiography that he was given mescaline by Dead guitarist Jerry Garcia on Saturday afternoon. At the time of ingestion, Santana thought he had several hours before he was going to be on stage. However, immediately after taking it, he was forced to perform due to the various scheduling changes. This face comes over and he goes, if you don't go out now, 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 <laughs> you know, you're not going to play at all, all you. On stage, Santana described that his guitar turned into an electric snake, which he felt he had to coax to stay straight. Still, his performance was incredibly memorable and helped put Santana on the map for decades to come. While Woodstock was certainly memorable for the incredible music and vibes over that August weekend, it was also notorious for something else, the weather. As early as Friday night, there were issues with rainstorms that caused set delays and cancellations. Organizer John Morris recounted in Woodstock the oral history that things didn't get any better on Saturday, and there were even gale force winds that afternoon. The stage itself started to move with the wind, and the massive speaker towers started swaying, too. Soon, lightning kicked in, and the stage had to be briefly cleared of all electronic equipment. In searching for the sound, Phil Lesh recalled that the Grateful Dead band members kept getting electric shocks from their microphones and instruments. The wind also picked up again, and people backstage began shouting about the stage collapsing in on itself. Much of the Dead's electrical problems stem from the lack of adequate ground and the fact that the band was playing high impedance instruments. Coming very close to a horrifying mass electrocution, the band was close to getting lethally shocked just by plugging in. Luckily, nothing happened and the Dead got through their set, though it was relatively poor by their own estimation. Looking back at Woodstock 50 years later, it's safe to say that it was a very male-dominated event. Of the more than 30 acts to perform, fewer than a third included women members. However, even though they were underrepresented, the women of Woodstock put on some of the most memorable performances of the entire weekend. Joan Baez performed one of the most legendary sets of the festival to close out Friday night, full of civil rights-themed protest music like We Shall Overcome, which enthralled the audience. Another highlight of Friday was singer-songwriter Melanie Sofka. Sofka was filling in for the incredible string band, who wouldn't go on during the thunderstorm, and immediately became a sensation. The performance jump-started her career, even though she performed for just under 20 minutes. Legendary vocalist Janis Joplin also performed with her band Big Brother and The Holding Company. Though she was intimidated and heavily intoxicated, Joplin still performed a very well-received set. Her soulful and passionate vocals alternatively rocked and soothed the massive audience, forever linking her with Woodstock. Not to be outdone, Cynthia Robinson and Rosie Stone followed Joplin as part of Sly Stone's Family Stone Band, wowing the audience with their funky renditions. Though they weren't in the majority, the women of Woodstock certainly rocked just as hard, if not harder, than the men. While today we look back on Woodstock as one of the most monumental music events of the 60s, at the time, its impact was much less certain. Defining Moments Woodstock recalls the Woodstock organizers offered bands twice the normal rate to get them to agree to come. Two of the biggest paydays belonged to The Who and Jimi Hendrix, who were both able to cash in big for their performances. At some point, word got around that the organizers were low on cash flow, and two of the biggest bands, The Grateful Dead and The Who, both refused to go on stage without cash in hand according to organizer Joel Rosenman's Young Men with Unlimited Capital. Both of them demanded their remaining fee of $7,500 before stepping on stage, and Rosenman was worried that if word spread, soon everyone would be demanding cash right away. I had this vision of Pete Townsend sitting on these Who amplifier cases, swinging his legs back and forth holding his guitar. In the end, Rosenman reports that he had to fly in the branch manager of the local bank by helicopter to get funds at the last minute. However, the Who frontman Roger Daltrey stated in his autobiography that Rosenman made up the entire story about the helicopter adventure and simply wrote them a check. Either way, it's lucky they came to an agreement, or else Woodstock 
might have ended then and there. For all of the chaos and confusion of the day, it's a miracle that Woodstock was able to function as well as it did. The organizers had their hands full from the very beginning, as they quickly became responsible for the health and well-being of close to half a million hungry, thirsty, and mostly intoxicated hippies. While the festival went on for the most part without major issues, not every performer had the same experience, and some of them didn't even make it to Woodstock at all. The massive traffic jams prevented several acts from arriving at the farm, including Iron Butterfly. According to Pete Fornatal, Back to the Garden, The Story of Woodstock, Iron Butterfly was scheduled to perform at the festival and actually made it to LaGuardia Airport in New York City. The band sent festival organizer John Morris a telegram demanding to be picked up, to which Morris responded with a carefully crafted acronym of an expletive. Needless to say, Butterfly never arrived in Bethel. Other groups were supposed to play at Woodstock, but disintegrated before the festival could be held. The most famous was the Jeff Beck group, which Beck purposefully broke up before Woodstock started, leaving them unable to play, according to Annette Carson's Jeff Beck, Crazy Fingers. Woodstock was billed by the promoters as three days of peace and music. And while that worked out for the most part, there were still some tensions present at the event. The audience at Woodstock was a confluence of anti-war protesters, civil rights activists, and young men and women looking to experience the music and unity of the era. Unsurprisingly, they did not all see eye to eye. Though their set was known for their incredible performance of their rock opera Tommy, the Who's set is also infamous for a few other reasons. According to Michael Lang in The Road to Woodstock, from the man behind the legendary festival, at the beginning of the set, guitarist Pete Townsend kicked filmmaker Mike Wadley to get him off the stage, and things didn't end there. Halfway through their performance, prominent anti-war activist Abby Hoffman got on stage and started talking about the Vietnam War and the recent arrest of John Sinclair for marijuana possession. While Townsend did not necessarily disagree with Hoffman's rhetoric, he had already warned everyone to clear the stage following the Wadley kick. When Hoffman came up and started his diatribe, Townsend smacked him with his Gibson guitar, sending him flying off the stage. It wasn't exactly the peaceful message the organizers had in mind, but it did clear the stage and allow the Who to continue to lay waste to the 400,000-odd fans in attendance. 